What happened to our risk-free investment? What can I say, Chris? I've been watching the commodities. It's very tricky. With market fluctuations, we can't always predict. Terrific. We're wiped out and you turn into Joe's parrot. This is not a frat party, Chris. This is big business. This is hardball. Now, if we play, we take our knocks and we bounce back. When there are reversals, we have to maintain flexibility. You're buying into that crazy bastard's... Eric, do you really believe Joe's paradox philosophy? Some of it. I believe in what works. And I believe Joe. And he has promised to return $300,000 to us. Joe just lost all our money. Why are you listening to him? Why? Because he has done whatever he has set out to do. And that's more than I can say for the rest of us. Yeah, okay, he blows a lot of smoke, but that's just his way. He said he'd form the BBC, he did. He said he'd get investors, he has. And if Joe says he'll return $300,000 to us, I believe him. Our inheritance is gone. We're ruined. And you still believe Joe? You need a different perspective, Chris. This is external. This is paradox crap. Why don't you look at it from this viewpoint? We don't have a choice. Nobody is going to get our money back but Joe. And Daddy isn't going to save us this time. One day we received incredible news. Ron Levin had set up a credit account for Joe to trade with Stephen Raleigh, a commodities broker. I first heard of it when I walked into the office. Climb, baby, climb. What's going on? Ron Levin came through. Joe's on the phone with the commodities broker right now. Yes, let's stay with the T-bills. I'll call you back on the bonds. Thank you, Mr. Raleigh. Tell him, Joe. Ron Levin set a five million credit account for me to trade. What? Five million? And Joe's been trading since yesterday morning. How's it going? Up $350,000, more or less. And climbing that baby, still climbing! <laughs> <laughs> Joe traded the Levin account for seven weeks. What was the result? It fell off at first, but picked up again, and by the seventh week, Joe had grossed $14 million for that account. $14 million in seven weeks. It was a complete affirmation of Joe's system. Everything Joe said had come true. The BBC share would be $4.5 million. Joe had single-handedly solved our problems with one account. It was tremendously exciting. We leased apartments on Wilshire Boulevard and some of us moved in. It was... Party time! Okay. Dean, Amy, and I have this apartment. Todd's taking the one downstairs. Brad's moving in at the end of the month. Now we can just get the motor pool into the garage. Then we can drive the management crazy. <laughs> hey, hey! Hey, hey, hey! Mm -hmm. oh. Better watch it. I'm gonna take this one back from me. Back? Yeah, this is my first serious relationship. What, fourth grade? This got braces on. Didn't you introduce Amy to Joe and Judy to Chris? Little old matchmaker me. <laughs> and with our newfound wealth, the BBC social scene is gonna light up the LA sky! Yeah! Didn't I say Joe could do it? When it started rolling, it was unreal. Joe's Ron Levin account dropped from five million to two million in four days. I nearly died. Then the next day, it jumped back up to five million, then three days later to nine million, then the market surged, and in three days, Joe's account jumped to 14 million. In three days? Come on. Chris, I read the broker's report. It's true. A total jump from five million to 14 million. Joe blew them away. So it simply makes sense for the BBC to be physically living together. Physical proximity encourages symbiosis. I envision a compound where we can all live, work, and play together for instant communication and common protection. Protection from who? Them. Who are them? Anyone other than us. <laughs> <laughs> the garage would be a motor pool of our finest imports from trans-allied cars. Rolls, Mercedes, Lamborghinis, Ferraris. When you need one, you simply sign up for it. That would be great. Hey, there's just one problem. Uh, suppose Eric and I both have dates and there's only one Ferrari. Who gets it? Chris, I was illustrating a conceptual Numenon. But you weren't. A Numenon isn't tangible. A Ferrari is. I know I miss Numenon in philosophy. Chris, does she think for you too? 
She thinks, Joe. And I drive the Ferrari. Which brings us back to only one real imaginary Ferrari and two guys who want it. How do we paradox that, Joe? Jenny, I need these mailed right away. And uh, get me some additional copies of the Faraday contract. I'll get right on it, Mr. Kermont. Chris, got a minute? Sure. How's the cyclotron coming? We're about halfway. Well, I've been thinking, maybe if you spend all your time down on the plant on the machine, things might go faster. I'm projecting a high impact for the cyclotron on third quarter revenues. You mean move my office down there? Well, it might expedite the process. And besides, there's no need for you and Eric to be sharing an office up here when the plan is where you're needed. Full time hands on instead of this periodic interface. Whatever works. You're the max, Chris. A real team player. We need more of that in the BBC. And listen, anything you guys need down there, you just let me know. Okay? Eric, got a minute? I'd like to get your views on this commodities pitch I'm preparing. BBC Consolidated. Can I help you? Just a moment, please. What was the financial situation by this time? Great. Commodities were climbing. Things couldn't be better. Mr. Raleigh? Joe Hunt. Yes, Mr. Hunt. What's the equity in our account today? But Mr. Levin closed that account yesterday. I haven't talked to him today. Well, he said the experiment was over. Mr. Hunt, uh, you did understand that there was never any real money in that account. Mr. Levin set up that account as a simulation, a paper test. Uh, the account was never real. You did understand that, didn't you? Of course. Thank you, Mr. Raleigh. What is it, Joe? Levin set up the account as a simulation. It wasn't real. 14 mil isn't real? What are you gonna do, Joe? Continue to see Levin. Naturally. Why? Because it's our only chance to get any money out of him. Or kill him. Mr. Raleigh, in your capacity as a commodities broker, would you please tell the court of your business relationship with Ron Levin? Objection. Irrelevant. Motive. It shows that Levin's deception of Joe Hunt was a motive for murder. Overruled. You may answer. When Ron Levin came to see me, he represented himself as a member of Independent Network News, doing a feature story on uh, commodities trading. So, to give our documentary authenticity, we want to set up a fake account. Just, just paper, no real money, no actual buying or selling. Mr. Hunt will be calling in his transactions. You treat them as if they're real. Does Mr. Hunt know they're not real? No, no, no. We, we want him trading with the emotion of a real situation. He must think that the money is real. Like, if, if he's on a, uh, a hot streak, does he become more daring? Will Mr. Hunt ever be told that the account is merely paper simulation? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, right after the experiment, before we go on the air. And was this television program ever produced by Mr. Levin? No. What was the financial status of the BBC at this time? None of our other projects were making any money, and the Levin scam was a tremendous blow to us. What did Levin say when you confronted him? Denial, as expected. He said he took the money out and put it in real estate. He said the BBC owns a piece of it. Do you believe him? Who knows? But Levin must have got something out of it. And what he got, I want our cut. And I'll keep dogging him until we get it. What about the investors, Joe? We'll send out a statement showing a slight profit. Joe, we're almost cleaned out. How can you be so up? A positive attitude is essential, Dean. We're simply going to tell the investors something that they want to hear until we can give them what they want. Only Levin's money had been real, all our problems would be. Joe, the map you ordered is finally up. Want to see? No, oh, thank you. I'll be right in. Okay. What do we tell the guys? Tell them nothing. 
It's absolutely essential that nobody knows that Levin scammed us. Hey, 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 hey. Come on. My system worked. Fourteen million dollars, and I can do it again. Now get started on those statements, and I'll see you tonight at the party. Hey. Mm-hmm. And tell all the guys to be very sharp tonight. I've invited Ron Levin. Levin, why? Obviously to throw off suspicion from our guys that anything is wrong. Besides, staying social with Ron is a way to keep in touch with our money. Hey, isn't it neat? It looks like a war room or something out of... What's that movie? Dr. Strangelove. No, I mean the one about computers with Matthew Broderick. God, how could Ron Levin have been so cruel? So damn unfair. If the guys find out, see how Ron Levin made a fool of me, they'll never believe me. Everyone believed that I'd saved us. I believed it. All I ever wanted was to make money for everybody. I've always wanted to create an organization that was an aristocracy of achievers. A family of power people that could... blast through the tyranny created by mediocre minds. Mediocrity has created a world whose economy is falling to pieces. Banks are failing as country after country default on their loans. Amy, soon all the real power will be in corporations, not governments. All power concentrated in assets instead of weapons. All it takes to control that is a financial base. And we had the seed. We actually had it. $14 million in six weeks. That's just a start. They have no idea what we can do. I've done this before. I know it works. We sell short and maintain our primary balance. That way, your fallback position is safer. Oscar? Ron, I'd like you to meet Oscar Rostelli, our chief legal counsel, Ron Levin. Hi, heard a lot about you. Joe, don't you let anybody in the BBC over 25? I feel like a fossil. <laughs> 27 is the cutoff point. After that, most people trade their dreams for security. And don't you ever lighten up? Excuse us, Oscar. Can I see you privately, Ron? Guys? Hey. How's it going down at the plant? Dirty. How are things at headquarters? Are we rich yet? <laughs> I'll let you know, Chris. I'll hold my breath, Eric. What's with you guys? Nice, huh? Ever since Joe moved me down to the warehouse, Eric's just bought into his whole act. We don't even speak at home. It's too bad. I don't even know who Eric is anymore. If we'd stop being brothers, we would. account it was a paper simulation why would he go to the trouble to set that up so he could take the simulated papers and show a 14 million dollar balance to another brokerage firm they didn't know the balance wasn't real they gave levin a loan for a million and a half <sighs> that is so slick <sighs> and
And then later Joe said that Levin promised us $300,000 of that one million five that he scammed. Did you receive any of that money? Never. It was a stall. And was this also where you introduced Joe to Frank Booker? Yes. Booker had been working as a security guard in our building. Frank. Hey, how are you? Okay. Glad you could make it. Come on in here. Joe. It's Frank Booker. Frank's got an interesting background. He's a former Mr. Universe. Glad to meet you, Frank. Yeah, me too. Frank's a fifth degree black belt. Yeah. Teaches karate. He played pro football. Yeah? What team? The Colts. <laughs> then I drifted into security work back east. What kind of security work? Bodyguard, electronic surveillance, firearms training. Maybe some muscle work? Maybe. So Frank Booker very quickly became friends with Joe. Soon after Joe Hunt met Booker, was Joe going to make him a member of the BBC? Booker will be a good guy to have around. What would he do? He can begin by teaching us karate. Mr. Rostelli, in what capacity did Mr. Booker work at the BBC? Uh, Booker hadn't been there very long when I asked Joe. Come on, what's a guy like Booker gonna do around here? With his body and my brains, we are the ultimate man. He's in charge of security, and he's my bodyguard. Look, Booker is from a different world, Oscar. We don't have his street savvy. I want to see if he can infuse some of that into membership. Booker was a heck of a fighter. An extremely physical guy. <coughs> One day at the warehouse, Chris and Brad were goofing around with Booker. He kept some of his gear down there. I want the two of you guys to grab the pipe and come at me, huh? Just grab the pipes and come at me, and I mean hard. You got it. Okay. <laughs> Make it come easy on you. yourself. Whenever you're ready. Booker had other assets, because he knew weapons. He carried a Derringer strapped to his leg. He also had several other guns. That's amazing. But it doesn't sound like it does in the movies. It was kind of a macho atmosphere developing around the BBC. Karate lessons guns, silencers. The, the warehouse was even used as sort of a firing range when Booker gave lessons. But business-wise, things are really coming apart. No matter what we do, the missions lab won't certify them. There's always something wrong. And at $1,000 per test, if we tried to get a special price, yeah, nothing. If we tried to pay him off. He state license. He said when the cars are right, they'll pass. He won't budge. Won't budge. shooting I was really bothered and Chris was my closest friend in the group Chris came back how's it going Chris you're not gonna believe this and I believe it already is Booker around no why what is it Booker and Joe shot up the certification lab what 
How do you know? They did it. I got it from a very reliable source. Believe me, they did it. They put on fatigues and they shot up the lab. And when Chris came to me with the story, it just seemed too outrageous. I don't believe it. I, mean, I, I just don't believe it. Okay, Beck swore it happened. Why would they do that? Isn't the lab refusing to pass our cars? Yes, Chris, but you don't shoot up the lab, you fix the car.